Good afternoon. I'm、uh, Andrew Xu. I'm the president of the College of Charleston. Welcome again、uh, to our next session. Our panel today,、uh, around the world with the Moroz Institute affiliates, is hosted by Mr. Bruce McConnell. I have the honor and privilege to introduce、uh, Bruce, who will serve as the host of this important conversation. I won't repeat everything listed in his bio, which、uh, you can find in your printed program. But I do want to highlight a few aspects of his career. Sorry about that. For more than 30 years, Bruce has worked in the area of cyberspace and its impact on peace and security issues on a global scale. His work in this area, I think we can all agree, has become more and more vital to us each and every day. As we find our businesses and our personal lives depending on technology for almost everything, at this, at its best, technology has the ability to connect, and at its worst, to disrupt. Related to our convening here at the College of Charleston, Bruce served as the last president and CEO of. The East West Institute, and he led the transition of the institute's work to other nonprofit organizations, and of course, including our John Edwin Moroz Global Leadership Institute. A major challenge in transitioning EWI was to partner with organizations who had the Capacity and international reach to continue EWI endeavors in conflict resolution. We're fortunate to have on our panel today representatives for from these affiliates and partner organizations, and they will offer us an around-the-world view of pressing international interests and concerns. Bruce, I will turn it over to you to introduce the panelists for this very informative and important discussion. Bruce, thank you, President Su. It's、uh, great to be、uh, here again, and also to be the last panel.、Uh, so we、uh, yielded up a little time to the immediate,、uh, but we're going to step back now and、um, try to come in as close as possible to four o'clock, so as not to interrupt the break too much. Um, I am joined today uh, by uh, my uh, colleagues from three of the four organizations that、uh, we transitioned、uh, EWI's programs to, and I will let them all introduce themselves.、Um, each of them will、uh, talk about their organizations and generally about its missions、uh, and priorities, and then the nature of the EWI programs that、uh, came to them and what those、uh, programs are doing now and the plans for them. Uh, with particular emphasis on the track two activities, so、um, we have been focusing here today and yesterday on the transition of the、um, archives and the、uh, the history and the spirit, if you will, of John Edwin Moroz to the College of Charleston. Uh, but in a, and uh, you know it has obviously turned out to be a great success. I mean, the energy in the last two days has been so exciting. I think. Everyone I've talked to has been thrilled uh, and uh, sort of confirmed that that was a really great decision. Well, we made some other great decisions、uh, as well, and so we're going to talk about those today. So, in addition to the、um, College of Charleston, we transferred、uh, all of our prior East West Institute programs to four other uh, NGOs. Uh, to the、uh, to the Stimson Center, which is represented by、uh, Brian Finley at the end of the row. Which took on our Russia, Mina,、uh, Sanya, and Hydro diplomacy programs. He will explain what that all meant.、Uh, the, the Bush China Foundation, David Firestein,、uh, who took on our Party to Party program. That's not about partying.、Uh, and then、uh, to the Observer <laughs> Research Foundation America, a new think tank、uh, that took on our cyber program. And Lee Rogerman will、uh, talk about that. And also then to the Atlantic Council.、Uh, but you have heard from. Uh, our correspondent there、uh, twice today already,、uh, Damon Wilson, who was the person who received、uh, 
um, Maya Pishkovic, who is, you have all met, uh, who is doing her work under the, uh, in the Balkans under the umbrella of the Atlantic Council. EWI was to, able to donate uh, four, almost four and a half million dollars to these, all these organizations, including the college, uh, to, to make this work. Uh, we outplaced 23 of the 26 staff at the organization successfully. Uh, we closed our New York headquarters, our Brussels headquarters, our Moscow center. Um, we closed uh, bank accounts in all three countries. We paid all our bills, and we uh, went through the amazingly complicated process of trying to dissolve a non-for-profit organization in the state of New York. It's not something you want to try to do. Um, it's almost done after almost two years. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I uh, will just go down the uh, line here and I turn the floor over to my distinguished uh, colleagues, both pa uh, past and present. Emily? Uh, thank you, uh, Bruce. Um, I think uh, just a little bit more about my background. So I actually joined uh, the East-West Institute in 2007 as an intern working on uh, global security issues and then uh, basically never left until the East-West Institute closed in, in 2020. Um, so I've worked on, on uh, global security issues overall, but then also helped uh, set up the cyber program at the Institute. I worked with uh, John Rose for a couple of years very closely, so that was very, very inspiring and, and definitely learned a lot from, from John personally. Um, I'm currently at the Observer Research Foundation in America, where I'm a senior program manager um, for the cyber initiative. ORF America is a relatively new organization. It was established in late 2020 uh, as an independent, nonpartisan, and profit uh, organization focused on uh, global policy issues that um, between the developed and the developing world and between the US and India. So we are affiliated with the Observer Research Foundation that is actually based in, in Delhi, which you may, may be familiar with. Um, our uh, areas of, of focus are uh, technology policy, policy, uh, which includes cyber issues, but also uh, climate, energy, and sustainability, strategic and security affairs, um, and, uh, sorry, I'm forgetting, economic policy, which is the last one. So we are still, um, you know, we've, we've been doing this now for a little over a year, so we are still expanding and in, in, in startup uh, modus. Uh, two projects that we um, have spent a lot of time on in the past year um, is in, um, an, a fellows program that we've, we've done, um, in, in Dubai, where we just concluded that together with the uh, PepsiCo Foundation and the USA Pavilion, where we tried to gather uh, young leaders from uh, the Middle East, uh, North Africa, and South Asia, trying to hone their leadership skills and, and um, develop them um, to be able to tackle issues in, in, their, in their countries as well. And then the other project I will talk a little bit about is the one that I've been working on for the past year, also together with, with, uh, with Bruce. Uh, is a project that we brought with us to, uh, from the East-West Institute to the ORF um, America. It's on a cyber capacity building, a project that we are doing uh, in partnership with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the, of the Netherlands on uh, convening uh, regional dialogues, uh, trying to build multi-stakeholder um, initiatives in those regions and try to raise awareness about cyber issues in countries that are uh, not really engaged uh, in, in, in discussions like this or that don't have the capacity to do this. So we are uh, in five regions uh, trying to do this in uh, Southeast Asia. We are working in uh, the Middle East and North Africa, Latin America, the Middle East, uh, I've said that, Southern Africa, and I'm forgetting the Western Balkans, <laughs> um, which, um, uh, so we've worked in, in, in uh, all of those regions, we've done virtual meetings, and the topics that we tackle really depend on the priorities of that region. So we could go from uh, cyberspace uh, governance to rules of the road to disinformation, which is uh, important in the Western Balkans, to sustainable development and digital transformation, which is a big issue in, in Southern Africa. So. Um, We've uh, done the virtual meetings and now um, uh, we're preparing for the next phase, which is in-person meetings, and we'll have our first meeting uh, in, the, in the Western Balkans, uh, hopefully in June. Um, and then I just wanted to uh, finish up telling a little bit, saying a little bit more about the transition from our, you know, the program from the East West Institute to ORF America. So uh, I, I've learned a lot. I was also involved in uh, closing down East West Institute and helping to transition uh, from that point of view, but then also making sure that our program was integrated successfully into a new organization, and I think the most challenging 
thing for me personally was that we went from an organization with a lot of processes and structure to an organization that doesn't have any of that yet. So I think the first couple of months were definitely a steep learning curve for, for all of us trying to, you know, set that up, but also trying to keep a project going that we brought with us. Um, so uh, I think I'll, I'll stop there. But, uh, you know, I think looking back now, a year later, I think it was remarkable that we were able to to do that, actually, and to move all the programs to other organizations, do this successfully, and, and I'm uh, personally grateful that, that I'm able to continue some of the work that, that we were doing there and that we, we, we did that successfully. All right, David. Well, Bruce, thank you so much, and it's great to be with so many old friends um, once again. Um, I'm David Firestein, and really honored and delighted to be here. Uh, I was at the East-West Institute for eight years from 2009 to 2017. Uh, I then left to join the University of Texas at Austin graduate faculty as a, a clinical professor and the founder of the China Public Policy Center at UT. And along the way, I had uh, the good fortune of meeting uh, Neil Bush, the third son of George H. W. Bush and Barbara Bush. And in our first meeting, he mentioned a really intriguing possibility to me, which is why I'm in the position that I'm in now. He asked if I would have an interest in becoming the inaugural president and chief executive officer of the George H. W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations. And I was very deeply honored. Um, and over the course of a year, I transitioned into that role. <clears throat> um, I know our time is abbreviated, so I'll just try to make a few very brief points. Uh, the mission of what we call the Bush-China Foundation uh, is to advance U.S.-China relations in ways that reflect the ethos, spirit, and values of President George H.W. Bush, which I might add were the consensus values, ethos, spirit, and values of all presidents preceding uh, Donald Trump all the way back to Richard Nixon, so very much a, a bipartisan approach uh, that, that had been embraced for decades in this country in terms of how the United States deals with China. And at the core of what we regard as the George H.W. Bush um, set of values in terms of how we approach China are a couple of fundamental beliefs. Number one, that the U.S.-China relationship is the single most important bilateral relationship in the world, and I would add in the history of the world. And number two, that virtually no global challenge can be enduringly or effectively resolved in the absence of U.S.-China cooperation, whether or not we agree with China on any number of issues on the bilateral agenda. What we strive to do at the Bush China Foundation is to generate or do our small part to help generate and catalyze a U.S.-China bilateral relationship that is functional, constructive, results-oriented, mutually beneficial, and politically sustainable. And that last point is particularly important given where the politics of China are here and where uh, the politics of America are in China. So those are the things that we try to achieve. Um, I uh, <clears throat> want to just say uh, that we are really, uh, were and are really delighted and gratified and grateful uh, that we were able to, uh, if you will, inherit uh, the party talks the U.S.-China High-Level Political Party Leaders Dialogue, otherwise known as the Party to Party Talks, or P2P for short. And uh, we were just delighted to be able to take that on and carry that really important body of work forward. Uh, I had been uh, privileged to be very deeply involved in that work during my eight years at the East-West Institute. And I think we really built something that is special and unique in the China field. Um, and namely, it is a dialogue at the highest level between three political parties, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and the Communist Party of China. And by the way, the, the profound gap in values, the profound absolute disagreement on core issues, the going at each other relentlessly. Well, enough about the Democrats and Republicans. Let's, <laughs> let's also talk about the, the, um, the, the, the trifecta of parties. No, it, it, was, uh, it, it is a special dialogue because it actually brings people together uh, to talk about politics, not policy, not policy, uh, but politics. And it's one of the few platforms where people can come together at an authoritative level with former chairs of the two national parties in our country. And in some cases, we've engaged the sitting chairs of the Republican National Committee and the Democratic National Committee, as well as... Uh, the top leadership of the Chinese uh, Communist Party. Uh, through this process, we've met Xi Jinping. Uh, 
Uh, we've met Wang Qishan, Li Yuan Chao, and other very senior leaders, members of the Politburo Standing Committee, and right down the line. And I think the value of this dialogue um, endures and probably is even greater now than it's ever been because of the evident gap um, between the United States and China on a whole host of issues and just fundamentally divergent worldviews and so on. And this uh, dialogue affords us the opportunity to come together in a trusted setting and in a place where it's okay to disagree and that we can disagree respectfully uh, and every now and then even agree, if you can believe that, uh, on certain issues, global issues, climate change, and certain other things. And um, we're just delighted to be able to carry this forward. And again, I'm very grateful to, to Bruce and, and to Bob Campbell and Bill Ide and Joel Cowan and so many others who were, among others, instrumental in getting this over to us. Um, I, um, I just want to say a couple of things before uh, turning the floor over to Brian. Um, and uh, on, on a, a couple of different points that I want to make that are not necessarily directly related to China, but that uh, since I have a couple more minutes or 90 more seconds here, I just wanted to take the opportunity to make. Number one, um, you know, I work on China every day. I used to work on Russia. In fact, when I was at the East-West Institute, I had a portfolio that was China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and part of the Afghanistan issue. And I remember the title of the talk I used to give my stump speech was, nothing to see here, folks. Move along, move along. Um, and now uh, I get to work, quote unquote, only on US-China relations. And that, that's been interesting. By the way, I remember learning when I was in college, uh, one of my professors once said that the, the optimists were learning Russian and the pessimists were learning Chinese. I learned both, so I don't know what that makes me. But um, what I do want to say is this. Uh, I work with China every day and I pay a lot of attention to Russia as well. The gravest, in my judgment, the gravest threat that the United States of America faces today is the untethering of our public policy and political discourse from factual reality. And if we don't rectify that, we will never outcompete China. But much more fundamentally, we will never solve the fundamental challenges that we face in this country. Um, we are living in la-la land to a great degree and to an alarming degree. And the Chinese have noted that and commented on it, I think, accurately in many cases. And we've got a significant swath of this nation that does not recognize empirical reality. And that, to me, is a problem that makes China look like a, a very minor issue compared to that. So I just want to point that out. The last thing I want to just say relates a little bit to Russia, and then I'll, I'll pass the baton to Brian. And by the way, I so admire Brian and, 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 and the work of the Stimson Center. It's an incredible organization, and I hope that we'll have opportunities to partner together. Um, but I, I want to say this. Um, some years ago, I gave a talk, and um, I think Bob Campbell and Joel Cowan have heard versions of this talk probably seven or eight or even nine years ago. But I just want to mention it now because it relates to the map that I think is at least still on those screens about Crimea and, and Ukraine and Russia. Um, I think I, I did some research and analysis over the years and discovered that there are five key ingredients to major international conflict. And I just want to mention those now because when I did this analysis and talked circa 2013, 2014, one of the conclusions I came to is that one of the 10 potential hotspots in terms of major international conflagration was Russia-Ukraine. I did not predict this, but I predicted that this is one of the possible areas of conflagration because it met each of the five criteria. And I just want to list those because it's relevant, I think, to so many of the issues that we're dealing with in the world today. I have a, an acronym that I use or a memory device of S-A-N-E-I, SANE. I. To have a major international conflict, you need a state, because if you don't have at least one state in the conflict, it will not generate enough mass to become major. The A is for autocracy. You have to have at least one non-democracy in the conflict, because generally democracies don't fight each other. The N is for non-nuclear. You have to have at least one non-nuclear state, non-nuclear weapon state, in the conflict, or else the principle of deterrence, just as we're seeing now, will hold and there won't be conflict. The E is very important, it was the nature of my talk, exceptionalism. One of the parties to the com conflict and usually the perpetrator of the conflict has to self-define as exceptional. 
what does that mean? The rules that apply to others don't apply to me. And you have to have an exceptional mindset, almost by definition, to engage in, uh, in a legal act of aggression against a sovereign nation. And the I is where the rubber really meets the road. It's the type of interest that has to be implicated to generate significant conflict. And the, the I stands, uh, the I has, there are two types of interests that must be implicated, one or the other, to generate this type of conflict. One is an existential interest, which means that if you don't fight this war, you're going to cease to exist, or, or your regime will cease to exist. And the other is what I call an identity interest, which is that the issue in your mind, or in the mind of your leadership, or let's say in this case, in the mind of Vladimir Putin, is so core to your sense of identity and who you are that it becomes existential in that regard alone. The Ukraine situation and Russia's invasion of Ukraine meets all five of those criteria. And the last thing I'll say is, I once sort of had a, a table of 200 countries on the x-axis and 200 countries on the y-axis. Theoretically, there could be 40,000, if you multiply those together, approximately 40,000 wars. But we all know that Madagascar is never going to be at war with St. Lucia, or the Bahamas is never going to be at war with North Korea. And the list goes on. When you boil it down out of those 40,000 possible conflicts, there are probably about 10 that actually could occur where all five of these criteria exist. Russia, Ukraine is one of the 10. And I made that point in 2014. I didn't predict this and I didn't think this was going to happen, but it does match the theory. And I just wanted to share that with a group of folks who I know are very internationally minded and very concerned about preventing conflict. Thank you all so much. I'll turn the floor over to Brian. Thank you. Always a master course. Uh, you're with David Feierstein. Thanks, David. Um, so I'm the new guy, uh, having never been a member of the EWI family, so I, I wanted to introduce myself. I, um, uh, it's really a pleasure. I feel, I feel a little bit like I'm the valet at your EWI party, <laughs> which is probably an apt, uh, an apt analogy. I, I want to start first, Karen, by thanking you. I never got, uh, had the opportunity to meet uh, uh, Mr. Morose, but uh, I really am so grateful to you, to the board members, many of you are here, Bob, others uh, of EWI, and, and of course to you as well, uh, Bruce. Um, we are the beneficiaries at the Simpson Center of four of the programs, as Bruce mentioned, uh, that, uh, that we inherited, and remarkable programs uh, uh, they are. Um, I think we've benefited in, in a number of different ways, and I think you'll understand why. Uh, it was a little bit of a match made in heaven, uh, in truth, when uh, when we were approached by Bruce and the board of, uh, of East West to take on these uh, programs for a number of reasons. Our approach, I think, to addressing problems, world issues is very similar, and I want to tell you a little bit about the Stimson Center uh, to help situate it. Um, and I think uh, the culture of the organizations were very similar as well, uh, certainly in those people that we inherited from, uh, from East West. And, and last, uh, I think our MO are, is, is quite similar. It's very practical and very operational. Uh, our work, and, and I know that East-West work was, uh, as well, really guided by the vision of, uh, of, uh, of John Morose. You know, I, I, as I was sitting here, I, 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 I'm thinking of this uh, and thinking of uh, sort of our, uh, our MO as organizations. I'm thinking of, an, of a New Yorker cartoon. Now, it's my favorite New Yorker cartoon. Most New Yorker cartoons go way over my head, but this one is my favorite because I understood it. Uh, it, it's this picture of this man in tattered clothes. He's crawling through the arid desert, and um, he's looking up at this mirage of four people, dapper, well-dressed people sitting behind a table that looks quite similar to this one. And he's saying, oh, thank God, a panel of experts. <laughs> and I think it sort of, I, it was, uh, it, to me, it typifies kind of the spirit that East-West had, right? Get your hands dirty and make a difference in the world. And it's very much the spirit that imbued the, the creation of, uh, of the Stimson Center. We're youngsters. We're only 30 years old uh, in comparison to East-West. You had a decade on it. But it really is that, I think, focus on pragmatism and you know, a, a drive to make the world a better place that really uh, uh, brought Stimson together and has made it a success and I think is making uh, um, uh, the programs that we inherited from you, uh, not just uh, has built the reputation, uh, but has more importantly built the good work of, of Stimson. So uh, we work on a pretty wide variety of issues from uh, climate change where we're you know, pioneering kind of technical uh, and new technologies, in fact, on climate resilience to 
uh, addressing nuclear issues in South Asia. We're, we're, we're training peacekeepers on how to better manage uh, women and girls that are caught in conflict in Sub-Saharan Africa. We're working on atrocity prevention. We work on arms control, both conventional as well as nuclear. Uh, we adopted a rhino sanctuary in sub-Saharan Africa and built a public-private partnership of technology companies to try to operationalize and implement some of the findings on border security that we have been working. We're building a blockchain solution for the organization uh, for the prevention of chemical uh, weapons in The Hague to help track scheduled chemicals around the world, identify acquisition of illicit chemicals to prevent uh, the use of chemical weapons. We've done something similar with the International Atomic Energy Agency in The Hague. Uh, we're working uh, on a project and have been using satellite imagery to track North Korea's development of its nuclear program. And uh, we're also monitoring via satellite, don't ask me how this happens, moisture levels uh, in and around the Mekong Delta to help farmers manage uh, food security. So again, this very practical and pragmatic implementation of our research is so much, in my view, similar to the work that we inherited from the East-West Institute. And I think of the military-to-military uh, -military dialogue uh, between the United States and Russia. We uh, like, uh, although David is the real professional in this, uh, we, uh, we also run a dialogue that we inherited uh, from the East-West Institute that is uh, working with reti recently retired four-star uh, military officers in the United States and bringing them together with their Chinese counterparts. We're working on a new project building out of that work, bringing uh, together uh, representatives of industry, particularly in the tech sector, from the United States and China to find common areas of, of potential, uh, potential collaboration. We're working, again, thanks to the East-West Institute, trying to build track two dialogues between Iranians and Saudis. Uh, and we have worked uh, to expand upon the South Asia dialogue also that we inherited from uh, the East-West Institute, uh, focusing on uh, women and girls and the impact that water insecurity has on them around the world and trying to give them a voice, uh, not just to identify the challenges, but actually to identify practical solutions to, uh, to some of those challenges. So uh, let me just say that uh, I am so deeply grateful to the East-West Institute for uh, having bequeathed these uh, four gifts to the Stimson Center. They are in good hands, and I really do encourage you all, I hope, to, uh, to remain engaged in the good work that, uh, uh, that, uh, that you all created and that we are now caring for. Bruce McConnell. Thank you, thank you so much. So uh, a couple of things. One is uh, it occurs to me that we, we originally, actually this was a, we we're gonna have another expert on the panel, Damon Wilson, uh, who got promoted to, uh, because of recent events, uh, to be a plenary speaker. Uh, but uh, you're there uh, by missing uh, the opportunity to hear about the fourth program that we uh, transferred, which is our work uh, that we were doing in the Western Balkans. Fortunately, we do have uh, Maya Piskevic here. And uh, if we could get a microphone over to uh, Maya, I think she'd be willing to give you a, a brief introduction of what they are doing. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, you know, I wanted to, to just mention that in all these cases, the funds which the East West Institute provided to get, uh, get these programs uh, transitioned was basically a, a runway, to build a runway uh, for the programs to take off and, and fly on their own funding and support. And all of the programs have succeeded in now uh, transitioning, taking off on their own. So uh, that's a piece of the success that we're very uh, excited about. So, uh, Maya, tell us, tell us what you're up to in Serbia. Thank you so much, Bruce. Even if I'm replacing someone, I'm happy to have a chance to say just a couple of words. First of all, these two days have been really emotional, I have to say, and, and I was not prepared for that. And, and this was an amazing process, and I agree with, with Karen, and, and I don't know who also said that this is the new beginning, the new life. Of, of the East-West Institute. And it makes me so proud that I was part for a short period of time. Unfortunately, I never met John Rose, but I've heard about him so much, I feel as I do know him. But I just want to let everyone know how, how this process of transitioning the East-West Institute was something that I have never seen before. The focus on each of us and our programs 
for trying to find not just a home for, for, for the projects, but really the best possible place where we will be continue, be able to continue our work and, and, and uh, uh, make a real impact in the world as we were doing at the East West Institute. I was really touched by that and, and I'm really grateful, first of all, to, to, to Bruce, but Annalene and all, everyone else who was engaged in that. Now I'm at the Atlantic Council. This is the Washington think tank that has been by far the most engaged and knowledgeable and impactful in the Western Balkans. Our program, Balkan Dialogues, is not only alive but really expanding and our focus on the Western Balkans is, is uh, uh, expanding with every month. And now we are doing the Open Balkan project as well, regional economic integration, digital Western Balkan 6, and we never forget to say that the origin of the Western, of, of the, the Balkan dialogues is East-West Institute, and that it's, it still is where this all began. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much, Maya. That was great. <laughs> the, uh, the one unsung hero is sitting in the room here uh, was uh, of all this is uh, Jonathan Fanton, who is uh, was uh, selected by uh, our executive committee of East West Institute to uh, guide my work, help guide my work in in making this transition possible. So we all uh, all of us owe a great uh, debt of gratitude to you, Jonathan. It's wonderful to have been seeing you here uh, uh, over the last couple of days. Um, all right, well, we're uh, short on time, uh, uh, and so I will uh, mm, uh, go ahead and uh, ask uh, for a couple questions. Uh, Peter? Oh, or comments, even better. <laughs> get, get Peter a microphone. He's, you know, he may be a soft-spoken person, but his words have impact. <laughs> uh, my name is Peter Kastenfels, and I, have, I was a board member of the Institute for 15 years. I, like many other people here, I was a friend of John Moreau's personally also. I, I want to say, and everybody should know here, that the transition from the Institute after John died came down to the will and strength of one single person who enabled this Institute to continue living through all these fine organizations, and that is Karen. <laughs> and, and, and thank you. Thank you. Well, since since I have we the have microphone, a, there's a student question which ah. we perhaps. Well, I don't want to recognize you. Well, is that a student? <laughs> you want to take the microphone from the president? <laughs> <laughs> well. It's too late now. <laughs> I, I have a, a question. We have a group of students here, Introduction to International Studies uh, class. And as we're thinking about generational change and issues for the 21st century, I was wondering if you could comment and offer some advice to a, a group of students who are thinking about these issues. And, and if you could um, put in some pragmatic terms for us, I think that would be useful if, if you don't mind. So. All right, so that's a hard question. Uh, since the uh, most glib person on the panel here is Brian, I'm going to give you the uh, first, <laughs> the first shot at this. Uh, one, in you know, one, two sentences, okay? Thanks, Bruce. <laughs> um, no, no, no pressure, though. <laughs> you know, I think that uh, when you uh, uh, are where you are in your academic careers, you sit and stare at old folks like us who are uh, uh, saying, you know, the youth is the future. We need the youth. You know, I, I, I said on a, a panel just, uh, uh, just prior to this one that, you know, I get to see in real time, you know, my organization is a much younger uh, organization than most Washington-based uh, think tanks. And to me, it's, um, you know, the value that you bring to uh, addressing all of these kind of grand global challenges that we've talked about all for the past two days really is in your lack of understanding. You, you don't believe that the world has to be the way it is. Um, and I think for those of us who have circulated for too long struggling with these issues, we become a little bit um, uh, uh, depressed about the progress that, that we have made. And I really encourage you to continue to just break things along the way, ask questions, 
and um, uh, and 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 really kind of challenge the, the the status quo. It's something that I see in my own organization and my, the colleagues that that I work with, and I think it's the true value that our organization brings to addressing all of that long laundry list of issues that we uh, uh, that we spoke about. Um, just very briefly, uh, in terms of being very practical and, and uh, to your question. Um, a couple of things. One, I think really developing communication skills, both oral and written, I think is the is the most important single skill that you can have in terms of a skill set because that is so integral to everything that happens in terms of conflict prevention and nonprofit work. Uh, secondly, and this may sound like a controversial statement, but be fact based in what you say and what you write. Uh, that's not where the winds of our country are right now, quite candidly, but it's the right thing to do and don't shy away from that because the further we get from empirical reality and factual reality, the less hope we're gonna have of setting, this, setting the course right for our nation and for the world. And three, have the courage of your convictions. Tell the truth as you see it. Don't be afraid to, to disagree respectfully uh, where appropriate, but to disagree and to stand your ground intellectually. Uh, more often than not, you'll end up being right, and whether you're right or wrong, you'll feel good about it by the time you're done. Emily? Uh, thank you for the, for, the, for the question. I think I agree with everything that uh, David and, and, and Brian said. Uh, obviously, um, maybe uh, for, from my perspective as well, I think it's important to, uh, when you're working in a think tank or nonprofit, that you are uh, willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done. Um, I got a lot of opportunities at the East West Institute as well. Uh, also, John gave me a lot of opportunities as well, so it's also what you make out of it and what you're willing to do. So I think uh, working in a startup environment as well for the last year, it's like, you know, we're all working together. We're also a young team, or pretty young, I would say. Um, so just uh, trying to, you know, uh, do whatever it takes to get the job done is something that I've, uh, you know, taken from the East West Institute and brought with me to uh, ORF America, and I think is, is a very valuable, you know, attitude and skill. Uh, so. Uh, that's really all a hard act to follow. All I would say is kind of uh, uh, <clears throat> doubling up on uh, David's last point. It's you know just pay attention to your inner compass and uh, and trust it. Trust it on that. And on that, thanks. Uh, let's thank our panelists and uh, thank you all for being here. We, uh, Timothy, you're going to tell us what to do now. <laughs> um, we have some recognitions that we need to do, but what I have to say about the last two days is simple, and that's, wow, it's been a real treat. You know, we started out the convening with the claim that human skills such as risk-taking, vulnerability, creativity, and a whole lot of patience could handle and utilize difference to create a relaxed space in which that difference could be explored and fine-tuned until it started to resound back and forth and that the art of statecraft was more like music and lyric than it is sometimes in presented in media and in bashing each other back and forth. This, of course, requires partnerships. Partnerships that are vital because they educate us and they also extend our reach. I just want to point out how innovative the transition of EWI was. Most organizations like this, when they enter into a transition like this, just kind of dissipate. And EWI decided not to, to do that. But they decided to use their, their work and their energy to give power and further ability to organizations to can extend their legacy. And that is a very, very appreciated moment. It took a lot of work. 
and it took a lot of courage. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for creating these partnerships between the college and these, these affiliates that also empower each other back and forth. Now.